Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for February 9th, 2021. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? The Clutter Fairy Weekly is our weekly webcast and podcast where we talk about all things organized. And we are using all of your uh, comments on our social media channels to pick the topics. And people send me emails, and I'm actually referencing one of those emails today. So we appreciate that you do that for us. Thank you so much. If you're joining us in Zoom for the first time, you can share your comments and questions through the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let us know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And more people have been taking advantage of that option lately, and we're delighted. We really enjoy having you interact with us. Participation is good. <laughs> in the video. Right? We are also streaming live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and suggestions there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast every Tuesday, you can talk to us by calling 669-900-6833, use meeting ID 993-419-863, and password clutter to join the meeting. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get right to it. We're going to talk about setting priorities, and later on, we're going to announce the winner of our homework assignment naming contest and the new name, so stay tuned. But first, we want to follow up on last week's homework assignment, which we called Reboot Your Resolutions. We received an email from Isabel in Zurich, who's with us again today, who gave us a report card on several projects she'd planned for the first half of 2021. Isabel set some ambitious goals for herself, including selling a collection of porcelain pieces, working on extensive financial record keeping, and moving forward on a major home renovation project. She gave herself a score for January of 40 to 50% based on her sense of accomplishment with better results in some areas than in others. But in the scorecard she shared with us, she also observed that, and these are using her words, the necessary next steps are clear then laid out a few action items she planned to tackle in the coming week. Her plan included both must have and nice to have items. And it was very clear and specific. We want to give Isabel really high marks for having made significant progress on even one of her big goals. It's good to aim high, but it's also admirable to recognize and learn from the experience when you don't reach what you're aiming for. And Isabel has accomplished great next steps by conducting an honest assessment of her progress and making a plan and a commitment about what to do in the coming days and weeks. The obvious purpose of last week's homework assignment was to evaluate and adjust your New Year's resolutions, but we also had a hidden agenda of getting you to pay attention to your progress and to recognize both your accomplishments and where you've fallen short, and perhaps to find a source of motivation in the action of self-reflection. If our viewers and listeners put some time and thought into the homework assignment this week, then you automatically nailed it and you get a whole gold star. And Is Isabel gets a great big gold star for her very candid, clear, and thorough report card. So thanks for participating, Isabel. Okay, let's move on to our main topic, containing the day-to-day -day accumulation of clutter while trying to make progress against a backlog can feel like a juggling act. Sometimes we feel as if we're failing when we can't keep all the balls in the air. But just like juggling, organizing takes a skill set you can learn. And one of the key skills for the aspiring organizing acrobat, if you'll <laughs> forgive our tortured metaphor, is knowing how to set priorities. <laughs> so this is inspired by Abby and a chat on December 8th. She was making some comments about setting priorities. And one of the most important things that I do on a job is set up the priorities. What comes first? What comes next? What has to get done? What order to do it in? Which tasks aren't a good use of the time we have available? Which work is too detailed to handle right now? And I juggle these ideas around as I work with a client on what they have defined as their goals and their priorities. Sometimes a client has made a plan in their mind on how to start organizing an area. And the plan is structured around doing a lot of very detailed sorting work or following several steps with each item that they pick up to evaluate. Often when I hear that plan, I think, mm, we need to get there in a straighter line. We need the shorter path to execution here. If a client has called me, 
we can assume that they're not very familiar with or comfortable with the process of organizing. And that person usually imagines a multi-step circuitous route to organizing. And I believe it, it happens this way because they're overwhelmed. They imagine the most complicated way of handling the project because it feels that huge and scary to them. Surely this project needs a complicated process because it's so big and scary. I'm here to tell them that usually it doesn't need that kind of a process and finding your way through can be less work than you think. So tackling an organizing project can be like peeling an onion. First, the most direct layer first and then keep on peeling. So today, let's talk about what steps to do first and what to do last and what to skip doing altogether if you can. So for this discussion, let's start with a room that's very dense. So imagine your junk room or the room that got all the leftovers when the move was done or the storage unit or the basement. Maybe it's the room where all the cardboard shipping Amazon boxes get tossed after you receive a new Amazon box. So think of something that's stacked really high and intimidating, and how would you prioritize the task for that room? So if your room looks like a bomb went off, then start with whatever is the biggest volume. And the culprit is often the trash and the recycling. So go in with the sole intent of finding and removing any trash and recyclable materials, and that will make a big dent in the pile. This avoids a lot of decision making because clearing trash and breaking down recycling and removing dirty dishes is a quick and mindless removal task. You'll be picking up and moving things around without making final decisions while you search and that's okay. You don't wanna be distracted by decisions other than is this trash, is this recycling? And in a stuffed room, this helps make the volume more manageable and gets junk out of your way. And it'll take some time too. I have clients where I go and I spend three hours processing recycling out of their house. My client Zero is notorious for um, they order things and have things delivered to the house regularly. And they were doing that before the pandemic and after the pandemic where they stopped leaving the house so often. Now they're getting grocery deliveries and food deliveries and all kinds of bags and packaging is coming in for that. In addition to all their regular things we order online. And so I can go to their house and spend three hours just breaking down boxes and putting recycling in the recycling bin, gathering up trash and putting the trash out in the trash can outside. Like I can spend a long time doing that. And so if you have a big room that is a big mess like that, this is a perfect place to go and get that stuff out and make a big dent. It'll take you a lot of time. And you'll be surprised by how different it looks when you do that. So having pulled all of the trash recycling and uh, depending on who uses the room, dirty dishes, um, I'm imagining in my mind uh, a house where a teenage son would sit and play his video games in, in what was an unused living room, basically. And there was always the chair and then like 400 coke cans <laughs> soda cans like he would sit in there with a drink and play and then he would just leave all that stuff behind and so it, it was a place where i could go and spend a half an hour picking up his recycling and dirty dishes just to clear that room it was a very obvious cleanup thing but it took a lot of time <laughs> and so whenever i needed something mindless to do that was a perfect place to start so having done that part now you're left with a slightly smaller pile now you can make a pass through the space and look for things that are obvious donations. So these are the things where when you look at them, you go, oh, I don't need that anymore. And like, you don't have to think about it very hard. Like as soon as you see it, you go, I don't want that. It isn't something that makes you pause. You don't have to contemplate it for very much. You don't have to gnash your teeth or mull over whether you need it or not. We don't want to get to that stage yet. We just want the, I don't want that. I'm not going to use that. That doesn't fit. The ones that are pick, 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 easy, easy, easy. Go and grab those things and take them out of the room. Go bag them up. Go put them in the car for uh, taking them to Goodwill or wherever. Uh, go make those removed from the room. There's probably more than you think. 
And if the room is really dense and it's been piled up, there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that you have long since forgotten was there. <laughs> so when you start um, pulling it apart, looking for through the trash, you're going to be touching things. You'll be like, oh, I forgot that was there. And so you now you can go back and go, don't want that, don't want that, don't want that. So you're not trying to sort anything. You're just plucking out things that you know, obviously, that you don't want. So that's uh, onion layer number two. The third pass is... You want to go look for things that don't belong in the room. So what items do you see that are in that room that are not going to ultimately stay in that room? Oh, this belongs in my bedroom closet. Oh, this belongs in the kitchen. Oh, this belongs in the garage. You can go through and find the things that you know are not going to stay in that room. And you can make it one of your steps to pick up a few things go deliver them to the rooms they're supposed to be in, come back, pick a few more things, go deliver them to the room they're supposed to be in. If you go through all of the stuff looking for the relocation objects, then that will thin the volume out too. So we've now removed trash, recycling, dirty dishes, obvious donations, and things that don't belong there. So you've made three passes, you pulled out all kinds of stuff, and that is really gonna reduce the volume of what's in the room. What's left there, is a slightly different set of stuff that you're going to have to make more decisions about and be start to do your th thoughtful evaluation. But you have started the room with all of the mindless, easy decisions and reduced your volume in the process. And usually the trash and recycling makes a huge dent and um, the obvious donations um, may or may not be a big dent depending on what kind of stuff got put in the room. And then the things that don't belong there is usually a, a pretty good slice depending on how the room got stacked. Like if it was, if this is the room in the house where everything went after the move was done that you didn't want to deal with yet, then it's likely that a lot of the stuff in that room needs to go somewhere else. And so you can spend some time just relocating and that will shrink the volume as well. You're sort of a, imagine that you're sort of distilling it down to a more concentrated version. And uh, once you peel all the easy decisions off, then what's left are the things that are going to take a little bit more thought, a little bit more planning, a little bit more focus. You're going to have to make some more considered decisions, but it's going to be a much reduced volume at that point. And so doing all the easy, easy, easy stuff up front makes your overwhelming pile be a less irritating pile <laughs> it's, I guess the best way to look at it and it's also a good breaking point like if you spent an hour doing recycling and an hour doing a relocation and an hour taking out trash or pulling the donations out you've spent a long time and it's a good point to take a break and come back the next day and keep going like you know if you're not going to do it all in one sitting anyway why not spend the first couple of appointments that you make with yourself for that project, why not spend those doing the easy and the high volume stuff first and getting it out of the way and sort of getting your, you know, organizing juices flowing, getting the engine running a little bit, and you're doing it on the stuff that is less painful and just a little bit more physical. <laughs> and then you can come back another day to the other stuff. Um, so I also want to give an option to talk about a room that is uh, like a paper room instead of just a junk room. So if you're imagining that you're going to face a, a paper sorting project, so think in your head, um, you know, here's a box of paper that I picked up and stuck in the box and put in the closet because we were having a party, or here's when I was in the hospital and I didn't deal with mail for two months and now it's all in a box and I've ignored it or any place where in a home office where you have a lot of paper that's out of control. Uh, let's just think about a paper dense sorting project for the moment and talk about priorities for that. I actually just worked with someone last night who, uh, on a virtual call, who was sorting a big clothing hamper. So imagine a big clothing hamper empty of clothes, but full of paper. So apparently she had swept off the counters in the kitchen a couple of times and dumped it into this hamper and then went and put that in uh, a room that she's not using. And so it had been there for a while and she is um, searching for some tax documents that she needs to support her tax return. And she was guessing that they were somewhere in the hamper. And so we went looking for her. We went look, digging through. So I uh, sat with her and answered questions while she sorted paper. And so 
I first suggested that she take the hamper and turn it upside down in her bed. And she was like, oh, my God, you want me to dump this on the bed? I'm like, yes, I do. So dumped it over. <laughs> and then I started giving her instructions about what kinds of paper to look for first. And so the first thing on the list is you want to look at paper, but not all of the paper. So start with large volumes of paper like stacks of newspapers or magazines. If you have a bunch of here's a whole bunch of magazines that came through in the mail and you've never dealt with them or here's you know a bunch of newspapers that I got delivered to the house but I haven't thrown out. You can go and pull out newspapers and magazines and that really will shrink the pile. It makes the those things make those bulk paper things make the pile look a lot bigger than it really is. And so she went through and pulled out newspapers, um, sort of newspaper uh, grocery circulars and magazines and pulled and magazine catalogs. And she pulled all those out and was able to very quickly go, you know, these are all recycled. This is all trash, whatever. And um, and it was the hamper was half empty by the time she got done. That was, you know, the pile had shrunk by a lot. So that's the that's the equivalent of the, the you know go pull the trash or recycling out of the room the the paper pile is go look for the newspapers and the magazines and the catalogs and pull those out first and that will really shrink your volume. The next thing I told her to look for was uh, shopping receipts. So you get all those you know cash register receipts when you go anywhere and shop live and in person. Uh, not that we've been doing that a whole lot lately, but you probably have and she had. These were all pre pre pandemic receipts anyway, so it was a big pile and they're you know long and skinny and crunchy and they're easy to find because they don't lay out neatly in a pile of paper right they're always tails are sticking out somewhere, especially if they're from CVS. Right. If we, she pulled out some like that. It's like CBS. Why? The shortest receipt is like nine feet long. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so those create some chaos in the paper and they're easy to identify exactly because they're nine feet long. Right. So I told her to go looking for those kinds of receipts and partially because of the shape and partially because 99% of it is going to be trash. They're easy to see, they're easy to grab, and they're likely to be trash. So the first thing that you should look at in that receipt before you start trying to read it is look at the top and see what the store is, and then find the year. What is the date of the receipt? And so if it's a grocery store receipt and it's from 2017, you don't, it doesn't matter what's on that grocery store receipt, you can throw it in the trash. So the short, fast way to make that decision is what store is it, which will, you know, as soon as you see a grocery store receipt, you know, it's headed for the trash can. And then if you can see that it's not within the last week, any date beyond a week ago, means that it's no longer uh, actionable in any way. So unless you bought something really elaborate and expensive and, um, you know, durable good at a grocery store, which is very highly unlikely, you can probably trash it. And so those should be quick and easy toss. And then you're going to find, you know, here's Home Depot and here's Lowe's and here's CVS and here's you know, things that are non-grocery store, other stores. And you might have to look at the store name and look at the year. And then depending on what the store is, you might have to glance at the total. Like I would go straight to the total. If the total is $10, then who cares what you paid, what you bought, it doesn't matter. Like throw it out. So give yourself a threshold. Like I don't care if the receipt is uh, $50 or less and I don't care what's on it. You only care if the receipt's $500. And then that means you, this is a receipt from the Apple store and you bought an iPhone, right? If you see an Apple receipt, then you know that it's probably a durable good and you're going to be more likely to want to keep it. But, you know, if you're going to the Dollar Tree and the grocery store and Home Depot, there's not a whole lot on there that really matters unless you're in the big middle of a home renovation project or something and you need to keep up with what you bought for the house. But generally, those are going to be trash. Okay, so that's an easy thing to thin out and you can uh, and they're easy to find because they're weird and they stick out. Karen on Facebook reminds us to remind everyone that when we say trash, it's a shorthand for trash or recycling or shredding. Depending whichever, on which you yes, is yes. You know, appropriate to, to the particular situation. Yeah, you are correct, madam. That is exactly right. So it, trash it if you're comfortable with that. Shred it if that makes you happy. Recycle it if you if it's a recyclable piece of paper. There you go. Thank you. You're correct. Okay, so 
you pulled out the magazines and newspapers, you pulled out shopping receipts. Now look for large envelopes. So we get mail that comes in nine by 12, 10 by 13 size envelopes. So it's great big, large flat things. And they're usually either a very elaborate marketing piece for insurance or something like it, or they're legally required notices or reports from investment companies. You know, we have to send you the financial statement of the fund you're in. We have to send you the prospectus for the fund we just bought into, that kind of stuff. Or they're actually important statements that you need to say. So they make the pile look bigger and handling them kills a lot of paper in a hurry. So if you go looking for large envelopes, you can pull them out and go, yes, that's an advertising piece, throw it away. Yes, this is a, a monthly investment statement. This is a monthly bank statement. I need to keep that. And you can open the thing and throw all the contents and keep the statement, throw all the advertising out of the envelope. You can shrink that down to the piece of paper you're going to keep or pieces of paper you're going to keep and get rid of the excess. And then if it's something from an investment company where they're saying, you know, here's the financial statement for the year for that fund you're in or that kind of stuff, here's the trade notification. We made a trade and here's, we told you about the trade. Here we're telling you about the trade. Well, that transaction is going to be on your monthly statement. So you can look at it and go, oh, look, we bought Home Depot stock. And then you can go <laughs> put that in the shredder and uh, let not worry about keeping it because it'll be a transaction on your monthly statement. So there's a lot of things that come in large envelopes and either they're really important or they are absolutely trash and they're sort of not a gray area in between. Um, you'll likely get legal documents in a big envelope like that. And so it's worth it to look for them because it, you may find that something needs immediate action in there or you may find that it's a whole lot of big bulky trash. And so- well, And the ratio is probably- 99 to one. Uh, yeah, I was going to say 50, <laughs> 50 junk to one important. One important maybe. piece of paper, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But that's, uh, again, it's a big and dense and heavy and it takes up a lot of space and they're easy to see and grab. And then they reduce the pile by a whole lot. So that's another of, layer. I thought of a, a metaphor that may make sense for some people, which is this is like when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. And oh, yes. you want sort of an easy win to, to, to simplify the process going forward. And so you get all of the pieces that are nothing but sky <laughs> right. or all of the pieces that are nothing but ocean. And, and you, you start out with you all collect the them off to Yeah, you, the edges, which are easy, you know, jump out and are easily recognizable. Getting yes. those easily recognizable things out makes the rest of the project much smaller, easier. more contained. And, That's a perfect uh, metaphor because yeah. everybody has done that, that you do that puzzle in stages. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. And, and it's exactly what I'm doing. I'm pulling out all of the sky <laughs> and I'm pulling out all the edges. That's what we're doing. So we've done, um, let's see, I'm going to go through the list again. We've done uh, newspapers and magazines. We pulled all the shopping receipts out. We pulled all the large envelopes out. So now every pile of paper has a whole bunch of notes with handwriting on them. So you have taken notes on the back of envelopes. You've taken notes on post-its. You've taken notes on random pieces of paper and they're all mixed in there. And each one of them is something that you have to read the note to figure out what the hand, why you were writing it down. Cause the fact that your handwriting exists means that there was some moment where it was important to you, even if it's not important anymore. So you're going to have to evaluate each of those handwriting pieces one by one and read through them very carefully. And so if you stop to read a note right now, it's going to slow you down a little bit. So what I do with that is go grab all the things that have handwriting and just make a pile of them and sit them to the side so that you can sit down with those handwriting pieces later and flip through them all at once and make the decisions. And in the meantime, you can go back and do other stuff. So you just want to make a pile to the side of anything that has your handwriting on it. And unless it's super obvious, it doesn't matter anymore. Like here's a grocery list and you can throw that away quickly. If you have to read it to figure out why it's important, just put it to the side and make a pile of it. And then you can come back and look at that stuff at the end. Then I would also pull out all the unopened mail and make a pile of them. Then you can open them all at once, throw out the inserts, the advertising pages, throw out the envelope, 
and evaluate the contents for whether you need them or not. So the process of opening, um, pulling everything out, throwing the extras, and then you end up with the the salient piece of information that you have to look at and decide whether you care or not. And that's a process that is better done at, as a big pile. So in that paper pile that we have thinned out, now you're going to be down to all the unopened envelopes and make a pile of them and sit there and open them all up. At this point, you should be almost to the bottom of the pile. <laughs> So depending on your own personal situation, I'm just trying to illustrate in as many ways possible that you can start with the easy decisions, the large volume stuff at the top, and make all those things go first. And it will just be like you're making an ever more concentrated cooking down of the sauce. And now you're down to the really dense, rich stuff at the bottom. And that's the stuff that will take a long time and require your consideration and evaluation. Um, it'll be some of the stuff that you need to keep and you'll be needing to make decisions about where does this paper go? Am I making files for them? Whatever. But I have stalled all of that more focused concentration work to the end on purpose because you want to it's the volume that is the most intimidating and it's the volume that makes you feel like you haven't made any progress. And so if you can do all of the low decision, uh, high labor version of stuff up front, then you can get your concentrated pile that you have to work harder at down to something that seems much more manageable. And I try to do some version of that everywhere that I go to work because shrinking the volume is like popping the balloon, right? It makes it much, much less intimidating. So I see that there's chatting going on. So is there anybody that have questions that need to ask about this stuff? Marcy asked, do you have a camera in my house? <laughs> yeah, probably. I could <laughs> house at this point it's you know many years of walking through people's houses and it always looks the same right so it was funny to deal with this woman last night because she was so intimidated by this hamper of paper it's like yeah that's just like so we spent 40 minutes and she cut it in half by 40 minutes and she was so excited and when I got off the phone at the end of our hour she was going to keep going and you know I told her keep going and send me a text message and tell me that you got it done. I'd be thrilled to hear how it goes. And so I'm, I'm hoping to see that text message today and it's never as bad as it looks. And it always, you always just need a way in. You always just need a way to get started. And so looking for the easy, low decision <laughs> making volume, Removing that stuff first is a great way to get yourself going and started and finding out what your real problems are. Like when you look at the big room and it's a big mess, it always looks like it's this huge, all it's this huge, huge problem. But the truth is there's a bunch of stuff that isn't a problem. It just requires your attention. And then you're left with a much smaller concentrated pile of problems that need a little bit more work. And so it makes it more approachable that way. Connie says, often after taking care of regular household tasks, I have no energy to, to attack my mini hordes, sorting through and deciding what to do with superfluous stuff. Can you talk about energy budget? Yes. And I think that if you're doing all your household chores and you're running out of time, then I would ask yourself if you can trade a little bit of time for the project that's pending for something that you can you can stall to the next day so say one regular household chore and stall it to the next day and give yourself 15 or 20 minutes of time on the project it will still take you uh, some time to get it done but if you can even put 15 minutes in to something if you can go and break down three boxes and fill one small bag of trash or pick up 15 pieces of trash every night for two weeks, then you will be making a dent and the project will be shrinking. It'll just be shrinking more slowly. It'll just be a pinhole in the tire letting the air out instead of, you know, 
slashing the tire open and it going immediately flat. <laughs> Think of it that way. So if all you can do is put a little pinhole in the tire and let the tire slowly, slowly, slowly get smaller, that's okay. And all you really need to do is forward motion of any kind. And so we've said this before, anything counts, right? And someone saying it's consistency is the key, yes. And so if your energy budget is all used up at the end of the night, then in order to make progress, you're going to have to take one of those chores and let it fall down the priority list and let your project move up on the priority list for a little while. So maybe you don't sweep every day, maybe you sweep every other day and you spend 15 minutes in your project pile. Or maybe you make up the, you know, <laughs> make it up. Which chore can you do every other day or do twice a week instead of three times a week or whatever so that you can reallocate a little bit of your energy to something that you're trying to get done? I was going to mention that one. I have 42 things that I want to do every single day. Yes. And I think part of the reason it's difficult to drop that is – Every day, doing something every day is a fairly simple assignment. And doing something every third day or twice a week is has more complexity to it from, mm -hmm. from the planning and putting it on a calendar point of view. Yeah, focusing. and. But, of course, every day is unrealistic for 42 things. And especially if you're trying to you know, break something down really tiny sometimes it's not it's not practical to do five minutes of something right because it takes you five minutes to remember how you <laughs> where you thing. were yeah mm -hmm. find your place and then you do five minutes of actual work and five minutes to put it away or refile it or whatever the next step is is impractical and so as tough as it is i think it's better to adjust the frequencies because otherwise yeah. you're sort of setting yourself up for failure if there are, you know, 42 things you, I'm exaggerating a little with the 42. Right, it's really but, only more like 14. <laughs> but but, but it you, is a know, list, right? If you have 14 things and you only get two of them most days, you feel like you're failing and you're not really failing. You're just being a little unrealistic in your expectations for yourself. Well, and this also circles back your um, a commentary from last week about habits, right? So if you're, if you have a habit of doing all of these things every day, your daily chores, you're in a habit of doing those daily chores, and it leaves you no time to do other things that you want to do. So maybe the question is, of all of these things that I do every day, am I just doing them out of habit or are they super necessary that I do? And so there may be some of those things that you just do out of repetition and preference that you can let some of those things wait or go in the short term in order to um, allocate and prioritize time on something you want to get done, right? And we all have habits about we reset the kitchen at night or we clean up this thing or we scoop the box of the cat litter. Or there's a list of things that you do that's part of your day. And maybe you can pause and say, OK, I, I just keep repeating these same chores over and over again. But I, then I never have time left over to do what I want to focus on over here. And so you do have to surrender something to give time to the new project instead. And maybe the fact that the project is there and is so big is part of the reflection of that you've never Alec you've never surrendered the time to focus on that project instead yeah Tammy has a good good question she says okay. what about OCD thoughts that demand I do things in a certain order like I must clean before I sort how do you try and put that in perspective you must clean before you sort well does that mean that you must clean the house or, before well, you sort the project I think or more or more generally I think OCD thought patterns get you locked into the idea that there's there's a right or perfect way to approach the thing. And organizing is one of those tasks that there's all, there's a bunch of paths to the same solution. 
some of them are shorter than others. Some of them are quicker than others. Some of them are, you know, less stressful than others. And all paths lead to the end result if you just stay doing it long enough. And so if you are having some OCD interference in your ability to declutter, then I would see if you can talk yourself into, okay, I need to do these certain steps, but can I do them for less time? Or can I do them in a different order? Or can I shift how often I do them? See, I know that the idea of stopping your OCD habits is hard. You don't, so that's not the goal here. I'm suggesting, can you slightly edit them or slightly shorten them or slightly change the order that they happen in? Something that makes it a little bit easier for you to keep going and focus on what you want to focus on. Or maybe experiment with the habit formation technique of linking one thing to another thing. Before I clean the sink, I always, you know, fill in the blank, pick something that you're hoping to add as a new habit. And when you reach that moment in the day when now, you know, now is when I always clean the sink do that other thing that's going to make the place a little better that's that's going to create a little more order that a little you know pick a little low-hanging fruit right Um, i'm going to sort paper for five minutes or 10 minutes before i clean the sink now i i feel the urge to clean the sink i'm going to stop and i'm going to open three pieces of mail before i go clean the sink and so divert yourself for two minutes five minutes little bit at a time and know that you're going to do this and then when after you've done three pieces of mail or five pieces of mail or you've thrown out the newspapers or something then you will go and clean the sink and maybe if you link those two together that's ed suggesting that you link them together so that you always get triggered to clean the sink you have a routine and a habit about that already and so use that um, daily reminder to trigger you to do something else first And that way, you don't have to be diverted for a long period of time. You don't have to not clean the sink, but you can stall cleaning the sink for two minutes or five minutes or whatever and still get a few little bits of little chip away, chipping away at your project. That's a toughie because the, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder is a. Yeah, is a a, a whole different thing. It's a complex diagnosis that we're, and we are not experts. As we yeah, said yeah, before. absolutely. We are not experts at all, right? So, when I um, read about when I read about obsessive compulsive disorder, I see some slight tendencies in that direction in myself, but not the kind of thing uh, like you know I have to wash my hands fifteen times or anything, you know, th- nothing of that nature. Right. Just sort of getting hooked on, you know, uh, this this list needs ten things, or I won't be satisfied, or you know that kind of thing. Fixation on round numbers, fixation on certain orders of things. So I, I feel like I, I understand it, but I don't experience it to that, you know, to the, to the yeah, depth. You're not of, compelled in exactly no, the same I, way. Right, right. The compulsions yeah. are not that strong. Yes. Forgive us for not being experts in this area. We're, you know, we're giving you what we got and, <laughs> and, we, and we are definitely not, uh, you know, the psychologist professionals, the psychology professionals. Um, Tanya Barnes has written a question that I think is interesting here. How to, how do I budget my time preparing my mom's estate for keep, toss, donate when the house is for sale? Recently, the house was in contract, but it fell through this little fire under me and I panicked. Now that we're back on the market, I don't know how to budget the time. I think (laughs) establishing a, an imaginary deadline or even a, a wishful a wishful thinking deadline. We I would like this house to be ready to turn over to someone else in six weeks, eight weeks. Something that's ambitious but not impossible. Impossible. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, your mom's estate is going to be. There's a whole lot of fine sorting when you empty someone's house. There's a lot of fine sorting and there's a lot of bulk process. So. A, I would go through the house and identify anything that you think is going to require fine sorting or anything that has your mother's data and information on it. So 
all of the paper files, any kind of paperwork and mail, any kind of documents that you find anywhere that you, the keepsakes, the photographs, all that kind of stuff inherently takes a really long time to go through and you don't have the time to do it. So you don't want to leave it behind and you don't want to process it right now. So I would go through the house, pull everything out that is identifiable to her or your family, pull the keepsakes, you know, here's the photographs, here's the things that are, here's my school records, here's my mother's, you know, family photos, whatever. You want to pull all that stuff out and all the unprocessed paper. And don't try to sort it on site. Pull that out and either take it to a storage unit or bring it to your house. It will be some collection, but it will be a smaller collection than the bulk of what's left in the house. Then once you, oh, I think of this as sanitizing the house. When you remove all of the personal um, identifiable things to your uh, mother and to your family so that it's, you know, it has names on it. It has pictures of people that, you know, it, it's got credit card numbers or social security number, that kind of all that stuff. If you pull all that out and sanitize the house with that, then take that project and park it somewhere so that you can deal with it after the rest of the house is handled. Then go back in and go looking for, here's all the stuff that needs to come out. As opposed to the furniture, this is all the other stuff in the house. This is all the, the other Here's the plates and the dishes. Here's the clothes and the shoes. Here's the, the rest of the belongings that are easily transported. They're not a problem to box. They're easy to carry away. Pull all that stuff down. And I don't know if you're going to make keep toss decisions for yourself, if you're going to try to absorb some of this stuff in your house. But I'm guessing that a lot of it is going to go to, it's going to go to be donated or given to family members. So I would concentrate on removing all of that stuff. It's easy to empty a closet of all the clothes and, and go and deal with those clothes somewhere, go and take that away as one big project. And so you can work your way around the house and get it down to everything but the furniture. And then you're left with the furniture disposal project. And so then that becomes, you know, who in your family is coming to take furniture away? Um, are you making all these donations to somebody? Is this all... Um, is it, you the furniture left behind with nothing else um, is sort of a version of staging the house a little bit. Like you can leave the bed in the room and the nightstand and the lamp. The house looks a little lived in, even without all the accoutrement, all the extra stuff that's in all the drawers and <laughs> the closet and the, on top of everything. And so um, you can pull all the extras, then go back and do the furniture last. And then that will ultimately be, you know, somebody needs a moving truck or you got to get your friends with a pickup truck or you got to get two guys. And so it's going to require some um, extra logistics to get the, the furniture out that the rest of the house probably won't require. And so if you can't get the furniture done before the house is on the market, then there's still people, then you can still let people come through and see it. There won't be anything personal to your mother. There won't be a lot of, um, you know, the closets won't be full. The cabinets won't be full so that it, it makes the house show poorly. Those things will be out of the way. And then you can deal with the furniture last. When all that's done and the house is sold, then you can go back to the paper project, which is going to be sorting all the paper, who wants the photographs, what of this stuff do I have to shred? What of this is supporting the handling of mother's estate? And I got to have my hands on it because I'm going to, I got to deal with her, her paperwork and file her tax return and stuff. And so you can deal with that on your own time in your own house after the, your mother's house is handled. Does that help? I hope that helps. It's a way of sort of stepping yourself back out of the house a little bit at a time. Joyce says, I feel like I have to do all the decluttering before all of the cleaning. The professional organizer I've worked with suggests cleaning as I declutter, but that's still as much aspirational as habitual. And Marcy chimed in to say, I feel like I have to do it all before doing almost anything else. I feel bad if I do something else or want to go out somewhere. I understand the inclination. Like when I look at we, we had an incident a, f a month or two ago, something spilled in the refrigerator and 
it, as spills do in the refrigerator, it managed to trickle down the back and get on another yes, shelf. Yes, and, and get underneath the shelf and in the bracket. And, and you know, in the <laughs> ideal scenario, you rapidly use up as much food as you can and then take out what's left and clean everything and then clean every surface meticulously. But that is a commitment of, I don't know, three hours, three hours. or something, who knows? Mm -hmm. And there's nowhere else to put the food while you're, you, know, you have to put the food in a cooler with some ice if, it, if it's going to take you a long time. And so I've had to accept that I'm going to move the stuff on the left side of the top shelf and clean up the primary mess and clean up the things that were sitting in the primary mess and deal with the rest later. And, and so I've chipped away at it and I think it's all clean now <laughs> and right. someday probably when we move out <laughs> I'll find the bit I missed but because there are only so many hours in a day mm -hmm. and you can't stop and spend three hours on the refrigerator well and I think that the the inclination to you have to declutter before you clean means that you never quite get to the end actually or you never get to the cleaning part and so this is where I think it's important to not think of, I have to declutter the whole house before I can go to the next step. If you lay that um, prescription down on top of the kitchen counter, so I need to declutter the whole kitchen counter before I clean the kitchen counter, is an easier task that can be accomplished because you can get to the end of the counter and then have everything processed and go back and wipe the counter down versus I have to declutter everywhere in the whole house before I start cleaning. And so, and I will tell you that I, like I go in somebody's closet and this is a place that collects dust a lot, right? Because the shelves are over people's heads or the, the clothes that don't get worn a lot tend to get dust. And sometimes there's a AC vent. And so there's a vent blowing into the closet that's making dust. And so I will be reorganizing a closet and finding places that need to be dusted that haven't been dusted for a while. And so I will stop as I make, make my rearrangement and clean that stuff, wipe that stuff down because it's just part of the process of I'm reclaiming this space. I'm resetting this space. And part of resetting it is to clean it some. And so I may not do it as thoroughly as a client and the client can come up behind me afterwards, but I'm not going to uncover a shelf and let her make keep toss decisions and then go put things back up on a shelf that I haven't at least run the Swiffer over to, you know, and while it's empty, I'm going to go swipe the surface off before I go put stuff back on it. And so um, it is part of my process while I'm working to, um, clean a little bit <laughs> clean enough to ma to make what I reset work and so am I cleaning their whole house no I'm cleaning the things that are impacted by the work that I'm doing and so I want to reuse those shelves and so before I've taken everything off and we've sorted all this stuff and before I put things back up I'm going to wipe the shelf down and I'm going to swift for the top of the shelf way up over my head where nobody ever vacuums and I'm going to you know I'm going to wipe the around the baseboards around the shelving unit whatever I'm going to like you know take the opportunity while it's while it's naked basically <laughs> because it's so much easier to clean while it's naked right and so I'm going to clean that up before I put everything back if you're stalling the cleaning because you're trying to declutter everything I would say make that collection make that target area a smaller defined area you know I'm going to clean off this table and then I'm going to clean the table and then I'm going to put stuff back instead of I'm going to clean the declutter the whole house before I start cleaning the house. And sometimes, you know, I mean, when a maid comes, they vacuum around the stuff, right? So if you uncover a corner that hasn't seen a cleaning for a long time, then I would get the vacuum out and go and vacuum that corner before I go, you know, finish with that corner. So I think you just have to decide which one comes first. Well, and and, and that is and that is the and that's the focus today is priorities my dear friend and former roommate david used to say and you know you how you know what a neat freak david is oh he was a neat freak yeah but david would you know putter around in the kitchen after dinner and wipe down surfaces and you could see the wheels you know the wheels spinning and that he was 
thinking about what else he could do and what he could have what he should have done more carefully and what didn't get done but he his saying was good enough for who it's for <laughs> Me, meaning you know it's our house we're not we're not serving food to the, to to the first lady you know the queen right? is not is not coming today this and is so, not a catering company right? right it will have to do for the moment you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and we'll do more tomorrow you know i that's i i frequently have to stop myself and say i am not going to reach the level of perfection on this particular task that i would like right now but it's better than it was when i started yes and that is that's the biggest hurdle right because i saw somebody saying like they they clean something and then they feel like they didn't get anything done because there's still so much mess elsewhere but this is the nature of an organizing project you cannot only look at what isn't done you always have to look at what you got done because that's the only thing that's going to keep you motivated and going there's no point in looking at what didn't get done to flog yourself <laughs> if you're doing nothing i can see your point if you're doing nothing at all then yeah you, you know you're kind of stuck in something's not happening but if you are in motion and you are doing something every day and getting something done every day then look at the win, be happy with the win, because that's what you're trying to get is things accomplished, moving forward on your project and living to come back to it another day. And if you move your project forward, don't then turn around and go, yeah, but there's all this over here that didn't get done because there's always going to be more until you're dead. <laughs> there's always going to be more. And so you have to be happy with what you got done today if you're getting nothing done at all 100 nothing then we're having a different conversation but if you get something done then you're moving forward and you know how fast you get something done and it may take your organizing project three years instead of a year to get it done if you're not chipping away at it very fast so the the level of completion is going to be directly related to how much time you put into it every day but if you put something in every day eventually you get to the end that's and we've talked about that a hundred ways from sunday at this point you just have to keep chipping away okay and speaking of moving forward Oh, we it's are time. Oh my gosh. Really okay. running out of time fast. And Sorry, so, guys. you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip most of the usual announcements so we can get on to the announcement everybody's been, been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> so, in our first episode of the year, we unveiled the new segment of the show, which we tentatively called the homework assignment. And it's been very well received. A lot of people seem to be diving into our homework assignments with with uh, a lot of enthusiasm. That same week, we announced a contest to ask for suggestions for a less prosaic name for the segment. We received a lot of responses. Our panel of experts has weighed in and we've chosen a name for our recurring, recurring homework assignment. It's a little unusual, but we hope you like it and that it will grow on you. This segment of our webcast will now be called The Weekly Tittle. So you're probably scratching <laughs> it your heads. You laugh every time you say it. Well, and that's that was that's part of what we liked about it. Tittle is a kind of old-fashioned word that means a tiny amount or part of something. Mm -hmm. So it really seems to fit the assignments. It also has a second, even more obscure meaning. A tittle is the dot on the lowercase letter I or J. And you may have noticed that in the Clutter Fairy logo, which you can see there at the top of the screen, the dot on the eye has been replaced with an asterisk. When we did that years and years and years ago, the asterisk was meant to signify the extra special touch of the Clutter Fairy's wand. In other words, the tittle has had a secret Clutter Fairy meaning all, all along. <laughs> and now we hope that the weekly tittle will come to be a small part of something that you can accomplish each week energized by the touch of Clutter Fairy magic. So this tittle title, if you'll pardon me <laughs> torturing it just a little more, <laughs> was suggested by a long longtime friend and client of the Clutter Fairy who wished to remain anonymous and decline the prize. So we asked our panel to name a first runner up. 
And the prize of a free hour of virtual organizing goes to Liz Matsunaga, who offered several suggestions that ranked very well in our judging. We'll be in touch with you uh, uh, shortly, Liz, to provide instructions for scheduling your virtual organizing session. And thanks to everybody who sent us suggestions. And I hope that I can learn to say it without giggling every time that I say it. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't giggle every time you say it. Right? And so, Gail, would you, would you would you like to announce our weekly tittle? Yes, I would. And hold on, because I have to refresh my page. I realize that I'm not seeing what you wrote here. Oh, about it's, that. it's there. Oh, yeah. there we go. Okay. Okay. So our weekly, our first weekly tittle now is prepare uh, to, the title is peel the first layer of the onion. So like we talked about, we want you to take a current organizing project that you're finding big or overwhelming and choose the first layer of the onion to peel. In other words, identify one subtask or problem to address as your first priority. For example, if this space or the pile contains a lot of obvious trash or recycling, remove that material without stopping to make any decisions about what's left. If there's no trash or recycling, then make a quick pass just to remove anything that doesn't belong in the room that you're working on. And if there's nothing that's not, that's not out of place, that's not in the wrong room, then scan the space for obvious items that could be removed for donation. So those were the first three quick and easy versions of uh, crossover there. And we hope that you will go and try to address your project and just do these first early onion peel layers Look for the trash or recycling, look for anything that doesn't belong in the room, uh, look for obvious donations, easy, quick and easy decision making. So we want this to be a homework assignment that um, doesn't require a lot of brain power. <laughs> we just want you to do the easy stuff and see how much of a difference it makes in the volume of your project. And then make sure you make some notes and tell us what it's like. Come back and tell us about it next week because we really would like to hear how it goes and hear how you make inroads into your project. And for everyone who's already wondering, it's spelled T-I-T-T-L-E. <laughs> that's, that's the spelling. And okay, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events. Please join the meetup group by visiting oh. CF, cfhou.com slash meetup. <laughs> there you go. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you. We really had a great time with all the suggestions. and It was such we, a huge list. I could not I, believe how many yeah. people submitted. It was a really long list of, of options. It was, I, all, it was awesome. I think we're going to have to run another contest just because it was so much fun. <laughs> We love to hear from you, so please send us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments, on Facebook, or anywhere else you find us. And I should also flash that slide again and, and remind people that you'll be able to see show notes, including today's weekly tittle. And show notes will be at cfhou.com slash tcfw057. 057. 057, sorry. They will go up this evening or early tomorrow. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Um, I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Bonnie, who gave us a donation to Patreon this week. Thank you so much for watching and participating, and we really appreciate your joining the Clutter Fairy family on Patreon and helping fund our operations. And we will see you guys next week. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.